Poštovani gledalci, dobrodošli u još jedno izdanje emisije Granice istoka. Ja sam Harun Karčić. Nakon napada na Sjedinjene američke države 11. septembra 2001. godine, jedna je riječ dominirala svjetskim medijima – terorizam. Tada su talibani i Al-Qaida bili glavni neprijatelji. Zatim se pojavila oružena grupa Islamska država Irak i Levant, ISIL, koja je bila toliko brutalna da se Al-Qaida distancirala od nje. Sada je ISIL vojno poražen, a njihov lider Abu Bakar al-Baghdadi ubijen. Ipak, borba protiv radikalne ideologije je daleko od svog završetka. U ovom izdanju emisije analiziramo koji su to uzroci nasilnog ekstremizma i šta motiviše mlade ljude da se pridruže oružanim grupama. Prije razgovora sa našim gostima, pogledajmo uvodnu grafiku o ratu protiv terorizma i kakve je posljedice imao od 2001. godine do danas. Rat protiv terorizma. To je termin koji je svojevremno upotrijebio američki predsjednik George W. Bush nakon napada na Sjedinjene američke države 11. septembra 2001. godine. 18 godina kasnije pitamo se je li postignut cilj tog rata. Prema istraživanju američkog univerziteta Brown, američka vojska vodi rat protiv terorizma u 76 zemalja, odnosno u 39% država svijeta. Gotovo 7.000 američkih vojnika ubijeno je u borbama kao i blizu 8.000 plaćenika koji su se borili pod američkom zastavom. Istovremeno, ubijeno je više od 500.000 ljudi, uglavnom civila, u Iraku, Afganistanu i Pakistanu. Stručnjaci procenjuju da je ukupan broj ubijenih mnogo veći jer više ljudi umre uslijed nedostatka lijekova i hrane te hladnoće nego u direktnim ratnim dejstvima. Naprimjer, u nedavnom istraživanju New York Timesa otkriveno je da je broj ubijenih civila u Iraku u koalicijskim zračnim udarima čak 31 put veći od zvanično saopćenog. Poređenja radi, prema podacima globalnog indeksa terorizma, 18.814 osoba ubijeno je 2017. godine kao rezultat nasilnog ekstremizma. Odnosno, više ljudi je ubijeno u tzv. bori protiv ekstremizma nego što ih je ubijeno u samim terorističkim napadima. Kao direktna posljedica rata protiv terorizma, u svijetu je više od 21 milijon izbjeglica i raseljenih osoba. A koliko je sve to koštalo američke porezke obaveznike? Veoma mnogo. Sjedinjene američke države su od 2001. godine do danas potrošile 5,9 hiljada milijardi dolara u tom ratu. Novac je izdvojen za direktne troškove ratovanja, brigu o američkim veteranima i invalidima rata te preventivne akcije sigurnosnih službi. Ono što je počelo 2001. godine radi eliminisanja Al-Qaide pretvorilo se u dugotrajni, skupi i smrtonosni rat protiv sve većeg broja meta. Ratovi su rezultirali i masovnim kršenjima ljudskih prava i građanskih sloboda u SAD-u, ali i širom svijeta. A šta je sa talibanima? Nakon 18 godina američkog i koalicijskog bombardovanja Afganistana, talibani kontrolišuju 20% te zemlje. Toliko su snažni da su američki diplomate nedavno započele pregovore sa njima o budućnosti Afganistana. Detaljnije o uzrocima nasilnog ekstremizma te o mogućnosti pojavljivanja nove militantne grupe nakon isila na području Bliskog istoka razgovarao sam sa Omarom Ašurom, profesorom sigurnosnih studija na Doha institutu. Dr. Omar Ashur, hello and welcome to the Al Jazeera Balkans channel. Now to start with, do you see the possibility of ISIS making a full circle from being an underground insurgent group to being a proto-state and once again to becoming an underground uh, insurgent group? Um, some analysts such as Hassan Hassan, author of ISIS, an army of terror, have suggested that this, this group is far from defeated. Uh, I think I uh, agree that uh, IS uh, is far from defeated. Uh, ISI, the predecessor of IS and ISIS, the Islamic State, so-called Islamic State in Iraq, uh, was uh, completely demolished in 2010. Uh, most of its uh, cadres were killed. Uh, I think the estimate was 32, 36 out of the 42 main uh, mid-ranks and leading commanders were either killed or captured. Uh, the organization was in a very poor conditions. Um, however, it, four years later, it, it made a comeback. It, it made a comeback despite the assessment of, uh, of uh, U.S. officials like Leon Panetta, the head of the CIA and uh, uh, the Pentagon, that the organization was demolished. And the reason they came back is, uh, is that the, the, the structural conditions, the environment in which uh, IS operates, and not just in Iraq, but in, in the whole region, is there. It's, it's bro broken politics. Uh, politics in the region is, uh, 
the, the best and the most effective way to reach power and remain in power is by using extreme forms of violence, whether coups, uh, intense state repression, uh, or terrorism, whether state terrorism or non-state terrorism. Uh, and the way to legitimate this kind of extreme political violence in the region uh, to stay in, in power uh, is either by using religious institutions, uh, Saudi style, uh, or some kind of form of uh, hyper-nationalist uh, rhetoric and propaganda, Libyan Gaddafi style or Bashar al-Assad style. So these are the forms of actually staying in power. And, and ISIS did, did not come from far. You know, it came exactly from this environment. Uh, it makes up for its initial weakness, because it's still not a state, it made up for its initial uh, weakness by using uh, more violence, more political violence, more terrorism, and, uh, and intensified its uh, religious uh, rhetoric that legitimates this kind of or, or, or ideological religious rhetoric uh, to uh, uh, justify this kind of uh, political violence. Uh, so it did not come from the region. So uh, unless this region somehow votes constitutions, uh, economic and socioeconomic achievements and political achievements, unless they matter in terms of who gets in power and who does not get in power, uh, I think the, the structural conditions uh, will breed uh, organizations either like ISIS and makes it uh, makes ISIS survive uh, or breeds other kind of organization. It won't have the name of uh, ISIS, but it will have uh, another title. Now, what should be done with former ISIS fighters? Should they re be returned back to their home countries uh, or tried at tribunals within uh, Iraq and Syria or, as some have suggested, tried by an international tribunal? So this is a very complicated uh, issue, um, the issue of the ISIS uh, returnees and uh, ISIS fighters who uh, left the organization. Now, usually what happens, and this is uh, my, fo my former work, is about uh, collective de-radicalization, transformations from violence to non-violence, and, th and this happens when an organization uh, decides to abandon political violence, and the leadership of the organization endorses that uh, in some sort of a, uh, a political settlement. Uh, so usually the, the, the whole organization transforms either to a social movement, non-violent one, or a political party. Obviously in ISIS there is no interest in that. The leadership is not interested in that. And the ideology to, in a way does not permit that. Uh, so then you'll have to, lead, uh, uh, to, to deal with the returnees as individuals. And uh, in, in that case it's, uh, it's literally there is no theory that uh, or, or a uh, a comprehensive policy that deals with all of the returnees. It, it, it will need to be on case-by-case -case basis. You will find the individuals who uh, are ready for a de-radicalization program, are ready for rehabilitation, and in that, uh, in that sense it, uh, they, they will need a policy that deals with them. And then this is not a small audience, this is a, I think a significant percentage. You will find the ones who actually committed crimes um, and uh, therefore have to d be dealt with by, the, by courts and laws, uh, and th those will have uh, official policies. But the, 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 uh, the worst thing I think states can do is to, especially Western, democratic, uh, abiding by uh, laws uh, or, or states where they have actually the rule of law, not talking about uh, you know, dictatorships and uh, Syria like Egypt like uh, states, uh, but states that abide by law, um, I think they will need, uh, the worst thing they can do is to uh, start taking away citizenships because what they are basically uh, doing is uh, uh, justifying or giving uh, a cre uh, uh, credibility to what ISIS is claiming, that this is a war uh, against Muslims and uh, you either belong to us or belong to them. And when you take away the citizenship, um, you know, sp for a specific target uh, of a specific segment of the society or a specific individuals who uh, join ISIS, rather than trying them and jailing them and basically applying the law uh, towards them, then you're giving this message that uh, it's us or them and uh, you cannot be uh, somewhere in between. Now, is there a possibility of former ISIS fighters moving to new conflict zones such as Libya, Yemen or the Sahel region? Um, we have seen such movements back in the 1990s when former fighters from Afghanistan moved to Bosnia and eventually to Chechnya. It is possible. Uh, ISIS, the, the transition of ISIS from one place to the, to, to the other I is there. Uh, it happened. Uh, actually, they are recruiting at, at the moment in, in places like Libya, places like Iraq, even in Syria, the, the places that, that they lost. You know, they, they lost Fallujah 
uh, over two years ago and they still uh, are able to uh, operate there every now and then do operations recruit and so on so we're talking about uh, an organization that can morph and has the capacity to recruit and the environment as i said is is helping it out in terms of justifying and giving credibility to its uh, rhetoric to its narrative um, and uh, the, the way they, they, uh, they, they have the capacity still uh, to absorb. And they're not, uh, they, they are trying, they, they, they did not open new provinces in the sense that, uh, you know, now the, the provinces in Iraq, you had multiple provinces, now it shrunk to just the province of Iraq. So they're not really, they, they are shrinking in a way. Uh, but the shrinking does not mean that, uh, that there will be no expanding in the future. Now, how would you differentiate an ISIS defector who no longer supports their group ideologically from those returnees, but not defectors, who have only temporarily disengaged from the battlefield? Yes, there are, well, uh, de-radicalization again is a very complex uh, phenomenon. Uh, you will have the, uh, the group that ideologically de-radicalize, we, 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 we call them, the, and this, this basically that they abandon the ideology, they abandon the worldview. Um, and by abandoning the worldview, some people think that they will turn into liberal democrats. Uh, this is a very high bar. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't uh, go like that. It, they will just abandon justifying and legitimating uh, terrorism and political violence against the other, between quotations. Um, and they will, will basically uh, will not believe in that anymore. And they will go into different paths. Others, uh, we call it behavioral de-radicalization, so they will just change their behavior. Maybe they will be proud of whatever they did, uh, they will be proud of the you know, political violence past and so on. They will disengage from it, as, as in they will not embark on, on using political violence, but, uh, so this is behavioral de-radicalization. Um, uh, but also they will, uh, uh, they, they will still uphold some form of the ideology uh, there. And this is, also, uh, this is a different audience. Uh, uh, and then there are groups that, uh, what we call organizational de-radicalization, this is, this, these are groups that uh, will still somehow um, uphold some form of the ideology. Uh, usually they cease from the behavior because they don't have the, to, the, the means to do it. So they, they, they are not part of the organization anymore. They don't want to be a part of the organization. They are individuals, but they still have, uh, um, you know, some elements of the ideology still there. Uh, some elements even of the behavior sometimes is still there, uh, but without a collective capacity to uh, to uphold political violence. So the the, the the three forms, each of these categories, uh, needs a uh, specific policy to uh, to uh, to target uh, the the audience that that fits it. Uh, the best form, obviously, the most comprehensive form of de-radicalization is when you have the three, uh, the three dimensions. So the organizational part, the, we don't belong to an organization anymore, so we don't have the collective capacity to fight. Uh, we abandoned it ideologically, so we do not believe in political violence as a form of social or political change, uh, any form of political violence from coups to terrorism. Um, and then the, uh, the third is behaviorally, we disengage from, from using political violence as a, uh, as a way to change. Uh, if you don't have that, you usually end up with uh, so-called pragmatic de-radicalization, which means that you uphold the ideology, but you don't engage in the behavior, or, and you don't belong to, an, to ISIS as an organization. Uh, or you will have a uh, so-called substantive uh, de-radicalization, which means that you will, uh, you will still uh, uphold the elements of the ideology, elements of the behavior, uh, but organizationally, you don't. Uh, so, sorry, you will still uphold element of the organization, element of the uh, of the behavior, but you you, you won't. Uh, you will disengage ideologically. Dr. Omar Ashur, it was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Nezaposlenost, represivni državni sistemi i kršenje ljudskih prava su važni razlozi koji dovode do pojave nasilnog ekstremizma među mladima. Više detalja iz nedavne analize Arab Opinion Indexa koju je objavio Doha Institut u grafici koja slijedi.
Jesse Morton, nekadašnji pristalica Al-Qaida i njihov propagandista u Americi, ogradio se od te grupe i godinama radio kao doušnik i kontraobavještač za američke i sigurnosne službe. Pozdravljam ga u našem studiju u Washingtonu. Jesse, hello and welcome to the Al Jazeera Balkans channel. Now to start with, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi has been killed. ISIL has been territorially and militarily defeated in Syria and Iraq, but it will most likely take much longer to defeat its ideology. Um, how difficult is it fighting a war against an ideology and how effective have current CVE programs been? Well, I mean, I think we have to look at the trajectory and realize that we've largely failed, but I also think we have to be easy on ourselves because it takes very serious time to understand a movement like the Salafi Jihadi. Uh, I would call it a culture uh, or a movement more than an ideology. An ideology is the key cornerstone or the glue that might hold it together. And unfortunately for us, the jihadists have recognized that the world was transitioning into a world predominantly influenced by ideology, and they've been able to utilize social media to bypass what they call the mainstream media halo. Uh, if we look at the experience of the West and understanding the significance of ideology, we thought with the invasion of Iraq that we could simply go and spread democracy at the barrel of a gun. Unfortunately, what we found was that the ideology was keeping resistance up against that notion from many angles. And uh, Al-Qaeda very seriously and early on learned that they could sustain themselves from a hierarchical organization to one that was predominantly controlled by an ideology. For example, an Ayman al-Dawahri uh, sent Abu Musa al-Zarqawi uh, in Iraq a uh, commandment when he started to kill uh, civilian Shiites that the battle uh, for the hearts and minds was 50%, that the media battle was 50% of the war. Uh, meanwhile, we turned to our battle of hearts and minds operations to coincide with military intervention, but we didn't do so uh, until the Iraq war was already a quagmire. So we have a little bit of a delay time and we have a lack of expertise. Uh, however, defeating the idea is a key cornerstone uh, of any uh, policy that is dedicated to combating itself against Salafi jihadism. Yeah. Now, what, in your, in your view, are the major drivers of extremism among Muslim youth in the West? And why, what would motivate a young Muslim man living in New York, London or Brussels to live a rather comfortable life and join an armed militant group in the Middle East? I mean, you were once an Al-Qaeda affiliated uh, sympathizer. Uh, what drove you to become, to join these radical Salafi jihadi groups? So essentially what the Salafi jihadists provide is a, a complete comprehensive counterculture and worldview uh, that can appeal to people for a number of reasons. Everyone that is young in particular and increasingly Salafi jihadist uh, movement uh, concentrates on the young, particularly in the West. And every place that the information or the ideology is disseminated is distinct with regard to the drivers. So in some places it will be socioeconomic. For example, in Tunisia, when we look at the reasons that people went to join ISIS's caliphate, they were socioeconomic and politically oriented. When we look at Saudi Arabia and the Gulf, we find that the reasons that people joined were more ideological and less socioeconomic. And when we look at the West, we find that there's a disgruntlement with regard to uh, second and third generation Muslims uh, who are trying to identify uh, with who they are. Uh, and while they're identifying with who they are, they are frustrated and uh, disrupted by for whatever reason. It could be a number of various reasons. What Salafi jihadists offer is a comprehensive worldview, but an answer to every single question. The most interesting appeal of Salafi jihadism is that if you are a Muslim and trying to identify as a Muslim, but if at the same time you are frustrated with the world order in which it exists and they can politicize your interpretation of Islam, they can then argue that jihad and physical violence is the only means of attaining a political state under which Islam will dominate. And from there, they continue to push you along further and further into an ideology that accepts things like quote unquote martyrdom operations or uh, killing civilians in the street. It's a process. And they answer the questions, the needs that people have for significance, for belonging, for purpose. They also offer in some way, shape or form a reason to be a hero and an ability to fight for a cause. And they're very good at framing their grievance so that it is appealing, so that people feel like they belong to something that's bigger than what we're asking people to belong to at the moment, which is a nation state or a small collective and a small community. This is a transnational movement with widespread appeal because it gives you an answer to everything. But in your case, what exactly motivated you to join the Salafi Jihadi movement? Well, the same thing. I was born American. I converted to Islam, but I converted to Islam because I was largely frustrated with American culture and the experiences that I had in it. 
Unfortunately, I was not identified as an individual who was suffering from some level of trauma and whatnot. Um, looking for an answer to my questions of why I was alive led me to Islam, but at the same time, a lot of the pain, a lot of the anger, and a lot of the frustration I had with American society was then projected into the interpretation of Islam that I took. And so they offered a counterculture that was a revolutionary movement. I didn't like the world, it wasn't being kind to me, so maybe the best way to deal with it was to help tear down the world order. Uh, I gravitated very quickly after 9-11 to Osama bin Laden's argument, when our president, George Bush, made the statement, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists, I felt like I wasn't with my country, and so I joined uh, the terrorist movement. Uh, and this is what basically people are confronted with. Do you want to identify with the Western state in which you live, if you're in the West, or is there something bigger, more exciting, uh, something more interesting for you to engage in? Right. Now, since 9-11, Al-Qaeda was seen by many as enemy number one. Then ISIL emerged, and it was so violent that Al-Qaeda denounced them and distanced, them, distanced themselves from this group. Um, if conditions that give rise to violent extremism in the Middle East are, are still present, do you see the possibility of a new radical group, an ISIL 2.0, rising soon? I do believe that there is always going to be an ISIL uh, for the time being. Um, I'm not so sure that there would be a fragmented new movement because I think the ISIL brand name is so strong. I also don't think it's hard to replace leadership. And in fact, they were very quick to replace Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi with someone who has the lineage that traces itself back to the tribe of Quraysh or back to the proper lineage where he will be accepted as a Khalifa. That will allow themselves to continue to state that they are a legitimate caliphate. And it was the ability to do that in a matter of hours that shows their resilience number one, because the ideology and the justification for the state will continue, and that will continue to appeal. The uh, outliers of what could happen is a merger between jihadist groups, but what I think will mostly happen is there will continue to be a splintering and a fragmentation amongst Salafi jihadists, which is indicative and typical uh, of extremist movements everywhere. There are factions of ISIL already that are calling for more wanton violence, that have more extreme interpretations of the religion. This is the nature of extremism. But as far as the solid brand that is ISIS, I think it is uh, not as strong as it ever was, but it remains resilient and attractive for people all over the globe. Right, and finally, do you believe that Western governments, including the US, are making a mistake in the sense that they are treating the symptoms of violent extremism instead of treating the condition that gives rise to these symptoms? I do believe that we need to pay more attention to the context in which Salafi jihadi behavior occurs. Uh, I do believe that uh, one of the primary underlying factors that has been a complete failure was our inability now to project what we were uh, initially intending to do in Iraq, which was a democratic experience. We documented that democracy cannot be forced by the barrel of a gun. But what we've also documented is that the systems that are in place, the authoritarian systems, the uh, illegitimate uh, sort of leadership roles that people play, the networks of privilege in the Middle East are certainly what cause the grievances uh, that allow susceptibility to uh, the disease. So until we're able to try to help shape a context uh, in which uh, jihadism can be trumped, then uh, we will have forever this problem. And right now, geopolitically, massive uh, competition going on as a result of the war on terror and the war of attrition of the Salafi jihadists to weaken the American-led liberal order now is being challenged, particularly in the Middle East where there's really no taste for democracy. And so the alternative for many uh, is a growing and encroaching uh, influence by uh, countries like Russia, China, Iran, and that's not a better alternative. What we have to do is we have to learn how to practice what we preach and to back those voices that are advocates for democracy, advocates for human rights, and then to understand that we can set those seeds from there that will allow us to address the root rather than the symptoms uh, of a disease. We, one thing we know for certain is you cannot bomb or bullet your way out of this problem. This is something that has become very apparent but we now no longer have the tools of soft power and smart power to deal with shaping the context effectively. So we've got to pause and we've got to reset and we've got to think very differently about the role that things like aid and development play in the counterterrorism uh, efforts that we're engaged in. Right, Jesse Morton, it was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it.
Borba protiv nasilnog ekstremizma zahtjeva holistički pristup, koji se neće baviti samo simptomima ekstremizma, već i njegovim uzrocima. A neki od uzroka bijesa i gnjeva među omladinom na Bliskom istoku su zapadna podrška represivnim arapskim režimima, neravnopravna raspodjela državnih prihoda, zapadne vojne intervencije u zemljama sa većinskim muslimanskim stanovništvom i neupitna američka podrška Izraelu. Poštovani gledalci, bilo je to sve u ovom izdanju Granica Istoka. Ako ste propustili bilo koji dio, emisiju možete pogledati na našem portalu balkans.aljazira.net. Hvala na pažnji.